Hello, good morning. I'm Carla Bailo from the Center for Automotive Research. Welcome to today's webinar on bridging the gap to safe autonomous systems. Today we have three wonderful panelists that are going to join me in talking about autonomous vehicles. The, the interesting thing is, in my view, is if you would have asked me in 2015, 2016, I would have said by now autonomous vehicles would be everywhere. Um, not necessarily out in the rural areas, but we would definitely be seeing a lot more of them on the roadways. But we're not yet. We're seeing, you know, places of trials. We're seeing a lot of great pilots. A lot of great learning has happened. But I don't think it's any surprise to anybody that's in this webinar today that autonomous vehicles are very difficult, very difficult to program, very difficult technically, very difficult from a host of policy, legal, insurance issues. And all of these have to be handled, you know, in order to actually bring to life more autonomy on our roadways. We do know that that's the, the pathway to safety, um, to crash lessening, to a safe mobility ecosystem. So today we're going to talk about all of this and how we can do testing and simulation and how pilots are going to help us to understand um, how better to adapt our roadways and how better to deal with um, customers in the world of autonomy. Um, it's really important that we have the, the trust of the customer in this new world. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and we're each gonna, each panelist is gonna speak uh, for a short amount of time and then we will open it up uh, for question and answers. And I have some great Q and A already queued up, ready to go. But uh, I'm certain that our audience will also have some great questions. So if you miss the slides in the beginning, please put your questions in the Q&A box and I'll be monitoring that throughout the question and answer session. So I, I wanted to briefly introduce the three panelists that we have with us today. We have Brian Bresdevin from Amazon Web Services. We have Tino Schultz from uh, uh, DSpace, and we have Sean Harrington from Optimus Ride. So I wanna start right off with uh, Brian from Amazon Web Services. Brian is a worldwide industry lead for autonomous vehicles at AWS. He works with, cons with customers to accelerate their autonomous vehicle development via AWS services and partner solutions targeting incremental cost, time, and complexity organizations on their system development approaches. This knowledge is leveraged on solutions for the entire development workflow from in-vehicle components, processing and analytics, labeling, map development, simulations, and validations, models and algorithm development, and orchestration and deployment. Um, he's been in this field for 15 years plus, so I'm going to turn the floor over to Brian to share his introductory thoughts. Excellent. Thank you. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Give me a second. Let me know when you see my screen. Good to go. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you for the introduction. Yeah. So Brian Brezovan, um, I get to work with these customers globally on their autonomy programs. Um, those, those customers vary from OEMs, tier one suppliers, chip vendors, software vendors, startups uh, um, uh, across multiple different facets uh, um, uh, of the autonomy world. Um, these programs all use AWS as their development platform. That's really um, uh, the notion here. And it's not all AWS software that's deployed. It's de it's many times our partner software that's deployed. Uh, as you can see, we have DSpace uh, on the call. So a lot of times their, their software is deployed on AWS. Um, and in reference to kind of my thoughts around uh, safety, I'll refer to autonomous vehicles. I am grouping ADAS and ADS systems in the context of, of, of my discussion here. I'm just gonna quickly review a primer on simulations on AWS. Um, and the building blocks needed there to deploy these important functions to ensure safe driving systems for level two and beyond. So 
if I can get the slide to move. So with the, uh, what I wanna try to cover real quick is how customers leverage AWS for this AV development. Um, some background on simulations and validations as, as, as we see them. Um, by the way, you know, the, the, the world is evolving. So how we see them today may be different than how they look tomorrow. Um, how AWS services map to the overall needs with a focus on scale flexibility. And then I'll talk about some customer examples. So from a challenges and pain points for our customers, you know, we list some of them out. The, I, I don't wanna cover all of them. I wanna focus on the areas of replay and simulation uh, where we see uh, usage of, of this functionality for the validation use cases. Um, and we see this apply many times to every pull request that a developer uh, working on a new, a new model or a developer working on a new algorithm or a new firmware modification. Um, we see the need for this validation apply to many times every single pull request as part of the CI CD tool chain um, and ultimately kind of condensing the V model. Um, while we also see very large scale re-simulation runs on a less frequent basis. So imagine a world where every pull request simulates against maybe 500 miles or 500 scenes uh, of, of real world data, whereas the large scale re-simulation runs will run across hundreds of thousands, uh, uh, tens to hundreds of thousands of miles uh, and or scenes. And that's done sometimes every sprint, every two weeks, sometimes on a program increment or other milestone basis. Simulation is key as these autonomy levels increase. The need to leverage the real world and virtual world driving uh, assessment increases. So we've seen this in the level four systems for years where virtual world assessments via simulations across variations of scenes via brute force, random or AI based scenario generations are needed to determine the unknown unknowns um, as well as the known unknowns. Um, and, and that's really what makes you know, self-driving uh, so difficult and mapping that to ODDs and the, vari the variations therein. Um, so kind of with these challenges in mind, we have come up with an overall workflow uh, uh, around the autonomous driving uh, development. Um, and I'm not gonna go through each single function, but um, you know, the, the, the overall workflow here in, you know, with the functional steps in white is mapped to AWS services um, that uh, map to these, these functional uh, requirements. And, um, but it's also should be clear that it's not always an AWS service that's used. A lot of times it's an open source uh, uh, tool chain that's not managed by AWS. Sometimes it's a uh, partner software such as that from, from DSpace and others. And sometimes it's, it's, uh, uh, it's folks building their own uh, capabilities. Uh, but ultimately uh, what we see is the need for data acquisition and collection occurring both on test vehicles and production vehicles, uh, really making that data move into the system into what we call the autonomous driving data lake that makes that data searchable, visualizable and analyzable by multiple different user groups and then the associated development process that includes labeling, as, as mentioned previously, uh, model and algorithm development, simulations and validations, as well as map development, all orchestrated via machine learning and, and DevOps mechanisms uh, in, in, in the cloud. So I'm gonna focus a little bit uh, just on the simulation side. Um, we define it, as I mentioned earlier, with log replay or re-simulation. I, I use those terms uh, interchangeably, uh, where we're just really replaying the recorded sensor data from real world drives, whether it's a test vehicle, a production vehicle, or other, um, and evaluate how it reacts, um, uh, the system under test. And then on the other side, we use the synthetic simulations, right? As I mentioned earlier, to evaluate scenarios and variants in a simulated world, in a virtual world. Um, these two together uh, are really where the power is. So there's some typical requirements that we see 
uh, from these different simulations. And I'll just call out two, 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 two trends here. Um, but you know, first one is log replay uh, or re-simulation is very uh, data intensive. Naturally, it has to be able to pull the log data into a into a software and and then uh, and then evaluate how the driving behavior has changed or uh, or a specific key performance indicator has changed. Um, driving simulation side, um, on the other hand, we see it's really very very large scale compute uh, heavy, not as data uh, uh, data intensive. And so these are just trends that we see uh, out there. And so at at AWS, we have a number of different uh, compute instances available, um, but I'll, I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, as you know, we have you know 350 plus individual instances, but I will comment on you know kind of two of them on the GPU side. Uh, we have P4D instances that are powered by the latest NVIDIA A100 uh, Tensor Core GPUs. Um, uh, that that's really key for some of the more complex. Uh, uh, deep learning, uh, you know, requirements needed out there, uh, where the P4D instances provide up to 60% lower cost to train machine learning models, um, including about a 2.5 uh, x better performance for deep learning models compared to the previous generation P3s and P3DN instances. That's one example. Again, leveraging the uh, the NVIDIA A100 cores. Uh, the other example I want to just quickly touch on is um, the ARM-based. Uh, chips and uh, specifically the AWS Graviton processors, which are um, uh, 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 built around the 64-bit uh, ARM Neoverse cores. And, and where that comes in, uh, uh, it becomes important to some of our customers when we talk about simulations and validations, it's not just about price performance. That's very important, as we all know, but it's also there's also a need sometimes to match some of the environmental uh, parity, have environmental parity, what's in the vehicle to what you're using uh, in, in, your, uh, in your simulation validation uh, uh, hardware to try to drive uh, closer parity there um, uh, for um, higher preciseness on your simulations and validations. So, uh, you know, we talked about these broad compute choices. In addition, we have a lot of ways to consume these choices, uh, these different instances. And so uh, one of them is leveraging our spare capacity, AWS's spare capacity that we refer to as our spot instances. Uh, the reason why this is important is that there's significant cost savings for our customers over, for instance, leveraging what we call on-demand EC2 instances or compute instances. Um, and so this is this is a pretty, pretty, uh, uh, important for some of the really, really, really massive scale simulations that you can imagine are needed to enable finding those edge cases, finding those unknown unknowns that are so necessary as, uh, as autonomy levels go up and to ensure safe driving. And then another example or another uh, data point for everyone on this call uh, is just, you know, how to scale uh, apply? Well, we talked about, you know, many instance types, right? Different, uh, different processor types, even FPGAs uh, that you can deploy on AWS. All of this very important to matching the environmental parity needed uh, uh, of, of what's in the vehicle uh, on the ECU or the domain controller or zonal controller, depending on your, your terminology. Uh, but in addition, you need scale. And so this is an example of a test we, we ran uh, uh, with, um, with one of our, our customers um, uh, to really assess, hey, you know, we need to be able to benchmark at about 1.4 million vCPUs, these are virtual CPUs in AWS. Uh, and so we ran the test, this is on a Wednesday afternoon, uh, uh, and I think this was on uh, our, our US East region. Uh, and as you can see, we ran about, about 1.6 million uh, vCPUs. Um, so again, scale being key for both the re-simulation and simulation workloads. Now, I'm not going to go through in detail here. Uh, we don't have that kind of time, but I do want to comment that if you are interested in more details and more of a deep dive on how to deploy uh, uh, simulation and re-simulation systems um, uh, uh, effectively on AWS, we have some known good reference architectures. 
uh, you have that at your disposal. Um, and so this is just an example of one way to leverage AWS system for simulation and validation uh, together. And so I'm gonna now just touch on a couple uh, uh, customer use cases or examples. Mobileye as a customer has, uh, has uh, Mobileye powered cameras providing ADAS functionality in over 50 million vehicles. Um, leverages AWS for their massive scale simulation, specifically leveraging uh, those spot instances that I mentioned earlier, right? So you see, you know, peaks of 500K concurrent vCPUs in, in their particular scenario. Another example is lift level five, uh, similarly leverages the overall system, but specifically on the compute side, leverages EC2 spot for their uh, simulation use cases and Really, one of the key benefits that we target with, with, these, with these functionalities is to increase the velocity of development. And this was one of the outcomes that was, was really key, as well as reducing overall cost of operation. Um, with that, uh, I'm done. Those are my thoughts around kind of enabling safe driving in a cost-efficient manner by enabling large-scale simulations as well as validations in the overall development workflow. Thank you, Brian. And I'm seeing some questions coming in into the Q and A um, uh, location. If you have questions, please be sure that you place them there, and I'll get to those uh, later in the in the webinar. So our second speaker is Sean Harrington, who's the CEO of Optimus Ride. He brings deep expertise developing, commercializing, and scaling technology solutions with experience at both startups and large global corporations. Most recently, he was vice president of City Solutions at Verizon, where he was responsible for a broad portfolio of innovative products and services that help cities increase livability, sustainability, and safety for their citizens. Before that, he was the chief operating officer and member of the board of directors at Sensity Systems, where he oversaw technology development, marketing, sales, and operations for the company through its acquisition by Verizon in 2016. He has a BS in geomatics engineering from the University of Calgary and an MBA from Stanford. Sean, over to you. Carla, thank you. And, and thank you uh, for all who are participating. Looking forward to the conversation. Um, and share more about what we're doing at Optimus Ride and how it ties into this really important topic of how um, we, we manage the transition to autonomous mobility. So as Carla mentioned, I'm the CEO of Optimus Ride. We are a leader in autonomous mobility technology and services, and we're really on a mission to transform mobility uh, significantly. And we focus on a few key areas. Uh, one is safety, which we'll hit on significantly today. Uh, we are very focused on affordability uh, and equal access, uh, convenience, of course, being extremely important in any mobility service, uh, and last but not least, sustainability. And you'll see some of those themes uh, come through in what I share over the next few minutes. Um, we'll spend just a couple minutes giving an overview of Optimus and what we're doing out in the market, uh, both from a technology standpoint and a customer standpoint and market mm -hmm. standpoint, uh, and then shift over to the specific topic at hand here and how we see uh, managing safety and, and uh, customer adoption. So what makes Optimus Ride unique uh, yeah, within Sean, the AVs? Yes. We can't, we can't see your slides. We see your desktop. Okay. Not sure what happened there. Was that the whole time? Yeah. Yes, it's a lovely desktop. <laughs> Beautiful. How about now? Excellent. Yeah, very good. Well, apologies for that. Thank you for jumping in and informing me. Appreciate it. Um, okay, well, fortunately, you didn't miss any exciting graphics because I was sitting on this slide for those uh, first couple of minutes as I chatted about Optimus Ride. Um, so what makes us unique is the fact that we are focused on two main tracks in parallel. One is delivering on real mobility needs in the near term and focused on those environments where there are a high concentration of short trips at lower speeds and with a high degree of repetition. Um, and so 
these are areas like academic campuses, business campuses, downtown urban environments. Um, and you know, we're focused on those areas because they are the perfect initial entry point for autonomous mobility technology, both because with the, the concentration of short trips, uh, you have a set of riders uh, who, who really are, uh, you know, sort of motivated, uh, you know, to get a cost effective solution and you have uh, entities like the operators of those campuses or municipal governments who really care about the mobility of those constituents um, and are willing to help support this type of mobility service. And then of course, on the technology side, by limiting the speed and focusing on shorter trips, the challenge of getting to fully autonomous and, and the, the constrained environment helps significantly with that the technology roadmap in getting there. And so what we do is go operate our service today out with real customers in the field where we've deployed at five commercial sites and really address a broad range of use cases, some of which you see here. Um, often, if it's a campus environment, there is desire to get riders to and from some type of amenities or transit hubs nearby. Oftentimes, there are transit needs within the campus. Um, and then there are, are of course, uh, you know, event-driven mobility needs like, uh, you know, transportation to community events, um, sporting events, et cetera. And so we're out operating this service and, and delivering this set of core benefits, again, where you have the operators of these campuses or municipal governments in some cases or transit authorities who are looking at it and saying, hey, if we can go deploy this cost effectively and go get uh, you know, our, our riders a better experience than they have today, whether it be through you know, an alternative to parking and, and walking or using a shuttle bus or um, you know, some other micro mobility option like walking, which is slower, then they both get a cost effective solution and improve the satisfaction of their constituents while being able to, of course, achieve some of their broader mission uh, or objectives around sustainability and congestion reduction and sort of advancing technology. And so if you think about what we're doing in developing this full stack AV system and then operating a mobility service in parallel out in the field, you can imagine that, our, that our, we have a very keen eye for both maximizing safety as we get to fully autonomous in the coming years, while also really concentrating on consumer adoption in parallel and not saying, hey, we're gonna go develop the system and then release it and, and then figure out how we manage consumer adoption. So really there, there are these two significantly uh, disparate lenses on, um, on safety uh, and, and adoption. One is around the technical and regulatory requirements. So we clearly spend a lot of time and have a engineering team and safety and systems team and regulatory team that are developing the technology within the framework of all of the best practices uh, in the AV and, and uh, safety critical system frameworks. So that includes um, you know, doing the type of hazard analysis and risk assessment work, um, you know, building in redundancy and fault tolerance uh, from the very beginning into the design of the system. As Brian, uh, discussed in his presentation, of course, using simulation and active simulation to a high degree uh, to test various scenarios and use real live data um, that we've collected and played back into simulation, and then using real world vehicle miles, both on track and on road. Um, and then today operating that service as we're out in our commercial deployments with a safety operator there who is part responsible for safety and part responsible for uh, working with the, the customers and, and delighting those uh, customers. Um, and, and of course, through this, this, this whole process, we're working very closely with the, the regulatory uh, agencies like NHTSA who are overseeing 
uh, you know, safety of these types of systems. Now, separate from that, of course, we all know that a driver of a shuttle or any other mobility service is doing more than just operating the vehicle. They're serving as concierge and collecting payment and um, you know, providing information. And so we've been very conscious to build an end-to-end -end system from the mobile app that allows a rider to go um, you know, to request a ride and have visibility into the arrival and departure time of vehicle and, and all of the customer experience elements that you would expect now um, with modern technology uh, and, and that everybody's gotten accustomed to with ride hailing services. And, but then importantly, integrating that into the in-vehicle experience in such a way that we are able to ensure the, the rider has the same degree of exceptional customer experience, convenience, and sense of safety without that driver in there uh, in the future. And so with that, what we've done is, is really taken the, the existing mobility service that we're operating and, and created a phased transition to fully autonomous that will allow us to both you know, achieve the technical product and regulatory safety requirements at the highest bar, while also really focusing on that consumer adoption. And because we're focused on areas where there are short trips, where people feel more comfortable getting into an autonomous vehicle, where they're going at a slower speed, again, people feel more comfortable, where it's in an area like a campus or a workplace you know, our downtown area that people see where they see these vehicles on a regular basis and get comfortable with them and start to experience them first with the safety operator and then without the safety operator. These are all the elements we believe that are ideal for introducing AV technology and ensuring that we get to the level of safety required to operate them without driver and to make sure that the customers are brought along the way in parallel and are excited and enthusiastic about making this transition as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Very interesting. Can you tell me, I just have one follow-up for you quickly. Sure. Where do you currently have pilots on going? I saw pictures there from look yeah. like Washington, D.C. and in New York City. But yeah. Yeah. So we're, we, we've deployed five locations in five different states, including, as you mentioned, Washington, D.C. at a development by Brookfield, one of the largest property developers in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. It's called the Yards, and it's a mixed-use development where vehicles are taking uh, both uh, residents of the Yards as well as those who are looking to come in. It's a you know retail and commercial location as well. Um, so we're operating there, Brooklyn Navy Yard in New York, uh, you know, which is an industrial park slash you know tech ecosystem sort of corporate campus, um, operating at a uh, residential community. Uh, you know, and, and so it's, it's a real broad array. Excellent. Thank you. Um, our third presenter today is Tino Schultz from DSpace. He's an executive vice president for autonomous driving and software solutions. He has longstanding experience as lead product manager for hardware in the loop testing systems and as a developer and product manager for simulation models. His experience ranges from powertrain applications for classical and electric drive systems, vehicle dynamic applications to ADAS and AD systems, including bus and network systems. He holds a master's degree in mechanical engineering with a focus on control systems and combustion engines. Welcome, Tino. Hey, thank you, Carla, for the introduction and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so first of all, thanks for the uh, very interesting and, and uh, nice presentations uh, from AWS and Optimus Ride. I guess that's setting the, uh, the whole environment of uh, this talk today. Mm -hmm. So from, from the DSpace perspective, uh, I would like to also give a little bit of overview about how we see um, this topic of uh, safe autonomous vehicle. Uh, DSpace is a, a German, Germany-based company um, 
we are developing and providing solutions for uh, the development of um, control systems in the classical area, I would call it, in the powertrain area, in, in the electromobility area, but also um, for many, many years now in the ADAS and AD area. And not only on the simulation side, but also uh, on the area of uh, code generation, rapid control prototyping, and uh, system uh, design. So what I would like to uh, talk about today is um, the challenges that we have seen also in the talks before. So what, what from our perspective, what, what changes now? So uh, in the AD area, um, if I would like to summarize, it's more or less to get the IT into the car and not, not only the uh, IT into the car, but also get the car being uh, a, a device which is also looking to the environment, which is connected to, uh, to the cloud environment all the time, which gets update all the time. So that changes uh, the, the vehicle, uh, what we know from uh, five to 10 years uh, ago, quite a lot. So the software defines the vehicle. We have a lot more connectivity topics. Artificial intelligence comes into play. Um, Data-driven development is, an, is a topic. So we are not only having the, the code-based or model-based design and also the, the data and uh, neural networks plays an important role. And also the way how we do validation and verification changes a lot because we uh, have to consider uh, not only um, the vehicle by itself, but much, much more the environment, the connection to the cloud, uh, the connection to the infrastructure. But this, uh, in my point of view, gets some, uh, some issues to um, the, the tier ones, the OEMs um, that needs to address. So we have a real world product, hardware, electronic devices, sensors as a, as a real device that needs to, be, um, it needs to be validated, that needs to be developed, it needs to be tested. And on the other hand side, we have an, uh, a software development process that, uh, from the, uh, that goes on. So that's a continuous process. It does not stop with the release, with the SOP of the car. The car gets updated all the time. But still, we have to ensure the software quality. Um, we are getting massively increased number of test cases. So um, even in the past, um, we had a... a a huge number of test cases, but that's going to be uh, increased by, by numbers now. Um, that's uh, what, what Brian also um, expressed in his presentation. Um, also, we see a trend towards less real-world testing. So um, in, the, in the current vehicle programs uh, that we see, there's still a lot of real-world testing to ensure the safety of the system, to ensure the, the later uh, release to the, to, uh, to the final production lines. But that's yeah, it's going to be less and less, and simulation steps in. So, and if simulation steps in, the first step here is also always to use something like hardware in a loop simulation. That's increasing, but also the simulation in cloud environments uh, on the PC early in the development process. That's also increasing, and to make that really. Um, uh, a system that works for the developers, that works for the whole process, that uh, is introducing a continuous integration, testing and deployment, and the tools that we are using on the um, hardware simulation side, on the software simulation side, from our perspective, they have to go hand in hand. So to ensure that testing in the early phases can be rebuilt uh, in, the, in the later phases of the de development process, that I have a continuous tracking uh, of my test cases to ensure the test coverage overall. And since this is done uh, continuously, also for the life, uh, lifetime of the vehicle, um, that needs to be done uh, in the continuous process, not only until the start of production, but also later on. So if we see this process, there are a lot of uh, different aspects in there. Um, from the data recording to the, the uh, algorithm development, and uh, to the later simulation on hardware in the loop systems, replay systems. We have seen that also in the uh, presentation from, from AWS. If I collect this into bigger parts here, I would say in the, in the beginning, we have the data collection and the data enrichment because um, a lot more uh, perception topics, uh, AI algorithms are coming into the vehicle. So we need data 
uh, to, on the one hand, train those algorithms, but also on the other hand, to have the data available for later validation. So the data collection, the enrichment, the annotation, uh, the data selection plays a very important role. And the next step is, um, like I said, doing the machine learning, but also doing the software development. So we are not only in the, in the area of um, the perception algorithms, but we still have all the, uh, the necessary codes, um, the functionality uh, in the existing, let's say, vehicles. So the, the bus communication, um, the safety nets, uh, the, um, the algorithms for classical control algorithms, and that all has to be uh, combined and to ensure that um, not only the testing in the later phase can take place, but also even in this uh, phase, um, the testing has to take place and not only in an open loop manner, but also in a closed loop manner. That's important. And here, software in the loop simulation and also cloud-based simulation plays a very important role and is becoming even more prominent. And now, to integrate all of that and to test the system on different levels, so not only on the functional level, but also on the level of um, uh, interfunction communication, integrating the bus communication, integrating also the, uh, the safety aspect and test this, uh, not only on the real hardware, but even before, that requires the continuous integration, testing and deployment or development. And here, software in the loop simulation also in cloud environment plays a very important role. But to ensure later on also the, the safety aspect, so it's a system combined of hardware and software, uh, the system integration and testing also on the real ECU um, in, a, um, in a domain subsystem, in a, a complete vehicle uh, system has to, make it, uh, has to be done so that uh, the algorithms are also uh, being tested on the real system, uh, which is later on deployed in the car. And then we are deploying this in the vehicle. We are doing the vehicle testing. And then the whole uh, round is going to be closed because even then uh, the data are coming uh, new in and we have to adapt our algorithms later on for the, for the updates. So what we see uh, with, within DSpace, um, we have a solutions for all of these steps here from the data uh, collection area, what we call our Altera systems, also for the development here, um, for, the, for the code generation, but we still see in many cases a gap between the software in the loop and cloud simulation and the later hardware in the loop simulation over here to have this continuous flow of testing all on this uh, different uh, aspects of the, of the development cycle. And um, we are now bridging that gap um, in, this, uh, in this area to really support uh, the development activities to provide testing on the different levels uh, of this process. And what we call here is uh, the um, process or the, the tools in FERA, where we have a continuous HRL and software in the loop environment, uh, which provides a process that you can uh, do your testing, uh, simulation-based, replay-based testing uh, in the cloud, on the software and loop system, uh, on the hardware and loop system, to really make sure that in the different steps of the development cycle, you are working with the appropriate models. You can assign the different test uh, steps. So um, the, the classical test and also scenario-based testing, so um, that you are able to do these testing step by step in your development process uh, with the hardware and with the software. And to do this also, it's important to have uh, a realistic simulation. So having realistic scenarios and having realistic sensor simulation because the sensor is uh, getting more and more important. Um, so this integration into this process is very critical and that's what we are supporting with the Simfero topic. Another important aspect here is to be open for integration into given infrastructures. What we see is that processes are typically uh, already in place many times and uh, the, the toolings has to adapt into these processes to support these processes, to enhance these processes and to uh, keep also what is already available and has been used uh, in uh, current production lines. 
So, and if we see these different steps here uh, from, a, from a perspective of the data collection, uh, machine learning and software development and here in the validation and verification space, um, it's not only possible to do this just from, from a one tool supplier, that uh, does, does not work, but we have to have an uh, environment and infrastructure um, that supports partners. And partners are very important here. Uh, AWS is a partner. Um, uh, also others are partners here. Uh, for instance, uh, KPIT and, and, and BTC are partners. Also the sensor suppliers are partners because it's key to have not only the uh, simulation environment in place, but also to have the real um, um, sensor simulation in place here. And one example where we are doing this uh, is together with, a, um, with the German truck company MEN, uh, together with our partner BTC, where we are introducing this process step by step uh, from the system integration to the integration on the software in the loop level towards the data replay systems and data collection to really ensure that this is a seamless pro uh, process that can be uh, supporting also uh, later on uh, the, the different validation steps uh, in the different uh, areas of the of this process to later on having the safe vehicles on the road also according to uh, process requirements like ISO 26262. So that was a brief overview also not only from the from the perspective of um, of the process but also in terms of what kind of toolings are necessary what, why is the connection between the different steps important here and uh, this also needs to be leveraged with the partners um, that uh, um, contribute to this uh, type of process and uh, in that sense uh, we are supporting here and being partners for simulation and validation Okay, thank thank you. you very much. Thank you, Tino. Um, I'm going to start asking some questions. I see that I've had a few that have come in from uh, the audience, but um, uh, I have one all ready to go here. And Tino, if you can stop sharing, the audience mm -hmm. can probably see our faces yeah. better. There we go. Um, you know, all of you in some regards have talked about hardware in the loop, software in the loop. And um, Tino, you talked about on the vehicle, in the laboratory. Brian, you kind of talked about it in the cloud. And Sean, I imagine you use it in some way with, with your deployments. So how do you all work together? Let me start with Tino. You know, what does it mean when you're doing that kind of validation? How do you work with a company like Amazon? And then, you know, how do you work with clients out on the roadway as well to help with their development and their mm. algorithms yeah so um when when we when we see when we, typically when we are we see our customers our clients uh, they already have a, a, a lot of installed devices in terms of hardware in the loop and, and software in the loop and to combine all of this we are typically working together with a company like amazon uh, where um, the, the cloud-based, so to say, simulation comes into play. So that a simulation tooling, which typically runs on the Hill system, can also be deployed in the cloud system so that you can do all these simulation steps uh, in, a, in a greater scale. And uh, when I look to clients, for me, uh, it's, I, I would distinguish the clients between different, different types. So there are uh, clients like, like I would call it Optimus Ride, for instance, uh, who can really start um, this process from scratch and uh, develop it uh, right away from, um, let's say, with a, with, a, with a software development perspective here and build it up, um, uh, yeah, uh, right what we have seen. But there are many clients who have already installed devices, so we are upgrading this step by step. And then uh, this, this gap between HRL and software in the loop simulation is very uh, keen and very, very important to overcome that gap. And this is where we are supporting the customers. And, and Brian, you know, what, what does that, that mean, you know, in the cloud, because you can't do hardware in the loop in the cloud clearly, but you can do software in the loop and then that can go back into the validation process. Yeah, sure. Uh, so keeping this simple uh, for the hardware in the loop, 
uh, based validation and closed loop. So the uh, validation would be what we call open loop simulation and then closed loop simulation use cases with, with hardware in the loop. Um, uh, we see a couple very simple solutions there. The, the main one is, uh, is, is that the hill rigs that connect to either the sensors the uh, the electronic control units or the domain controllers, depending upon your, your terminology there. Um, those are deployed at either, you know, again, a, a co-location facility, a, a, a data center uh, or other. And those uh, facilities are equipped with significant networking, um, uh, leveraging services from AWS like Direct Connect, uh, which is a, a direct connection to AWS as opposed to internet connection that enables you to have both security as well as low latency and jitter and, and packet loss, which is key. Um, and so most of the Hill uh, vendors uh, uh, out there, I, I, I would you know, I'd say, you know, DSpace has obviously Hill hardware and software and orchestration software uh, as, do, as do others, you know, such as uh, uh, Electrobit, National Instruments um, and, and others. Um, but, but most of them can support uh, significant latencies on those links. And this is what I think is kind of key is um, enabling a global workforce because if anyone's done some of that workbench-based work, it's very specialized. <laughs> so a lot of times um, you need diversity in where those people can be. And so leveraging the cloud for, let's just say, hosting that log data as an example, as, as one part of the data-driven development process is kind of like foundational and then leveraging the networking that we have. We have, for instance, AWS has the most amount of points of presence of, of, of any other cloud vendor as, as uh, specified by, uh, by Gartner um, uh, in their um, report regarding um, uh, uh, cloud providers. And so, that becomes very important. Um, having high bandwidth, 10 gigabits, 100 gigabits per second, full duplex, uh, read and write, pull, you know, get and put, uh, as, as well as uh, uh, having that flexibility in the Hill system to accommodate some latencies to allow, for instance, if I'm deployed in, the, in North America where all my data is, but I have resources in maybe Poland or, 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 or the UK or Ireland, mm -hmm. They need to be able to have that flexibility. That means the latencies need to be supported. And I've seen empirical evidence that suggests that is supported. There's a second comment here, and this is an evolving, the one comment I try to, I wanna comment that there's a lot evolving in methodologies. Okay. Hill will always be needed, always. Uh, uh, you know, System level, component level validation, always. What we're seeing is a move towards also uh, uh, trying to allow your larger scale uh, 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 validation strategies to be deployed in like a hype in a public cloud such as AWS, and that's where that concept of environmental parity becomes really important because if you deploy with the same ARM and let's just say uh, image uh, image image processing system in the cloud that you use. On, you know, on the vehicle, that reduces the amount of variations that people see in the, in the behavior. Uh, so it's kind of two different thoughts there, uh, Carla. Interesting. And then Sean, um, how do you utilize this kind of system validation in improving the way your vehicles are operating on the roadways? Yeah, so it's, it's uh, super important to use a combination of simulation and um, track and vehicle, you know, on-road testing. It's, there, there is not a panacea, you know, uh, you know, one path. It is a combination. Um, so absolutely, we leverage the type of cloud compute and um, ver uh, verification validation uh, techniques um, through simulation that Brian and Tino have been talking about. Um, you know, we do leverage partners, we, we leverage, you know, cloud partners, for example, to a certain extent. Um, and then, of course, we, we develop our own and every company like Optimus has to make a decision about 
you know, where they want to go and, and take advantage of what's being developed in the market by companies like, you know, DSpace and the, the you know, the large uh, cloud providers uh, like Amazon. Um, and then what is, is idiosyncratic to their use cases and, and their operating environments. You know, as Brian said, all of these are, you know, quite complicated and you, you, you have to really make sure, you know, we always look from an engineering standpoint at, at what is going to be the optimal kind of use of our own development time versus getting leverage from partners. Um, but certainly we do, you know, a ton of work on the simulation side, um, you know, mm-hmm. both in terms of, you know, modeling what we call um, behavioral scenarios and behavioral competencies um, and, and running tests there, as well as, of course, just, you know, processing data to uh, develop models that are used for, you know, perception and prediction mm-hmm. and planning. So, Sean, besides, you know, the, the kind of technical element of, you know, getting the vehicle to, to drive autonomously and, and go where it's supposed to go, you're dealing with c- customers that are in the product and dealing with making sure we don't do something technically wrong so that we lose their trust. So, you know, what have you learned from the customer? What what are their fears and and what have you improved to to be able to garner their trust? And and what are you learning more? What what are those things we have to tackle? Yeah, absolutely. Um, And as I mentioned up front, Carla, we, we explicitly focused on going out and getting real world experience because we think it is important both from a technology standpoint and from, as you just described, from a consumer adoption standpoint. Um, so what we found so far is that uh, riders are very excited about autonomous technology. Um, we get many riders who come to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, for example, and go to work every day. And I was there not long ago and, and had a customer grab me when they found out I was, you know, the CEO of Optimus Ride and just raved about how useful the service was to get them to work on time every day. And, you know, the fact that they they really liked feeling like they were a part of the future of transportation. Um, so we measure NPS scores, so net promoter scores, and, and get feedback on a regular basis and have very high reviews. Um, and at the same time, uh, somewhat ironically, part of the, the way that we get consumers so excited about the service is through the safety operators who are in the vehicle today and can help explain what is going on. Mm-hmm. And of course, as we move to fully autonomous, we have to make a transition where people feel like they get that information elsewhere. And that's where the development of the holistic service is not just about developing technology to make a car drive by itself. It's about having an app that says, oh, I'm getting into the right vehicle and, and communication outside the vehicle, you know, through, um, you know, verbal and nonverbal or, you know, uh, uh, you know, visual cues, audio mm-hmm. cues. Um, and so it really is a, a holistic, um, you know, user experience, initiative to get riders comfortable with the fact that there there will no longer be that safety operator there who can explain it mm-hmm. to them. So we found through that, we really narrowed in on the few areas where they're looking for more information, like how long is it going to take to get to my destination? When is the vehicle taking off, uh, you know, starting to, to drive, um, you know, anticipating when it's going to make, you know, decisions, being able to have a feeling of what the vehicle is seeing in and around it for those who've driven in Teslas and you understand that experience of looking at your screen and knowing what what it is in and around. Riders really mm-hmm. get comfort if they have a sense that the vehicle is perceiving what's happening in and around them. So some, those are some of the elements that we're building into the rider experience, both as they approach, you know, uh, enter, ride, and then depart. It's that whole end to end that we're focused on. Thank you so much. And I'm going to go to um, uh, uh, some of the attendee questions. And one of them is not a question. It just says the people working at Optimus Ride are awesome. So kudos to the CEO. Um, So uh, there was a lot of questions about um, the simulation and uh, specifically for DSpace. Does the DSpace simulation tool run camera or LIDAR sensors on AWS? 
And how many can you run simultaneously in real time? And a secondary question was, how well integrated are you with simulation tools such as VTD or pre-scan? Myself, uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, uh, how, how many uh, sensors can be uh, can be executed? Uh, and it's, uh, indeed, uh, they are running on uh, AWS cloud systems. Um, I mean, uh, what what we can simulate here is the whole setup of the vehicle. One example that I can make here is, uh, for instance, an example that we made with ZF, where we have uh, simulated up to uh, uh, twenty five sensors in parallel. And it's important to mention here that it's not only about simulation of the sensors, they have to be realistic because uh, the perception algorithms really identifies uh, the, the realism. So material influences are important. And another aspect which is important is the, the synchronous uh, simulation of the different sensors also in combination with the bus communication because otherwise uh, the vehicle, um, the, the ECUs will not accept the signals. And that is really key here to make that happening. And that's what we can ensure with the hardware systems and also in the, in the cloud systems uh, with, with the simulation environment. The second aspect of the integration of other simulation tools, and I think that's, that's important, and this is why I was mentioning the partners, um, this is an aspect which DSpace is uh, supporting for many, many years now. We think that it's important uh, to have a holistic view on the complete process, but also to integrate uh, systems which are already in place on our customer side. So if uh, VTD and, and for instance, pre-scan, we have integrated then on, on several uh, hill systems and several applications uh, because uh, the customer here has an existing system. So that, that's something that uh, we, we are supporting, especially with our HIL systems. And um, that's, that's a key uh, aspect here, but for, for us it's important and I think that's one of the key aspects to, to understand this whole process and to, to support developers and the organizations to really have an, a, a running system so that there is a partner which really understands the whole process from the beginning to the end. Uh, and that's why uh, we are supporting this with, with our toolings. Uh, but on the other hand side, and that's also important, we are open for the integration uh, for others, uh, other vendors here based on standards. Thank you, Tino. And I have to go to the wrap-up question. Before I go to the wrap-up question, very quickly, Sean, the Polar Polaris Gem is an EV, correct? That was one of the questions in the- Yeah, it is. Yeah, and just to address, I mean, from a sustainability standpoint, all electric, uh, of course, and as the world moves uh, electric, we you know reduce emissions significantly. We can get into all the technical underpinnings there, but also importantly, we're focused on shared pooled uh, environments where you can you can reduce vehicle miles traveled in general, which is not the case for single occupancy vehicles. Many of the robo taxi companies are clearly focused on more single occupancy type use mm -hmm. cases, um, and so that also contributes to a sustainability uh, benefit. Thank you, Sean. And then my final question, I'm going to go in the same order that you spoke in the beginning. So I'm going to start with Brian and go to Sean and to Tino. You know, I mentioned earlier that, you know, if you'd asked me in 2015, I would have thought we'd have autonomous vehicles everywhere by now. So there, there are many issues that we have to solve to get from where we are today, which is maybe level 2.5, um, at least in most commercialized products to get us to level four at a minimum, and then eventually to level five. What are some of those hurdles that we have to overcome? And how do we say how safe is safe enough? Let's start with Brian. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm a relatively optimistic individual about, <laughs> about technology. I don't think I would be in this role or, or working for AWS if I wasn't, I didn't believe that you know, we can positively impact the world. Um, with regards to, you know, your question, I, I'm already seeing signs of level three vehicles in being deployed in production in, uh, in, in, in certain countries, um, such as uh, uh, Japan uh, with, right. with Honda. Um, and and that, that's great. Uh, and we have to learn from those systems. And learning is sometimes, you know, uh, understated uh, 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 value that we need to apply to our uh, to this to this world because it is going to evolve dramatically. 
Um, so we have to learn from, from how those systems are deployed. The problem with those level three systems that I don't fundamentally understand how to solve is not, it's, it's just an area I see people trying to solve is the human machine interface component of knowing when the handoff occurs, how do you alert the human, right? Whereas a machine only the level four systems, um, I'm, I'm very positive on that as well, e even in North America and the US um, with, with cities starting to open up uh, a robo taxi use cases and shuttle use cases in, in larger areas. And, and a larger area means that the unknown unknown vari variations increase in probability. And sure. so, so as time goes on, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty positive that, uh, that those, those systems, both for passenger vehicles, will keep evolving upwards. And the more vehicles that are deployed with the relatively similar sensor stacks and ability to leverage that data, the more learning, the more mapping to ODDs will occur over time. Where I think we could go as a society and as an overall market is, is leveraging each other's mappings. So for instance, you know, uh, uh, sharing of these unknown unknowns amongst the different companies. Right now, I, you know, I don't think that's gonna happen that easily. I think over time people will see that the power of many is gonna be more powerful than them spending so much money to do it all on their own. And it's those, you know, those kind of variations uh, and methodologies that will continue to drive us, I think, in that direction. So I'm, I, I, I think that's where I see, you know, the world kind of heading towards a little bit more democratic in that mm -hmm. sense. We'll just have to see. So more collaboration, as long as it's not my secret sauce, so to speak. Right. Sean right. And, and Tino, I have to give you 30 seconds because we're already two minutes over. Sean. Yeah, I think it's really about, uh, you know, making a transition and starting where there is the, the greatest opportunity to get consumers to adopt and to get real world experience, which is in these environments where there are the shorter low speed trips. Okay. That's really what we think is the fastest path. Thanks, Sean and Tino. Okay. Yeah, um, I think from, from, from my experience in the, in the recent projects, I see a, a clear trend in the commercial vehicle area where this uh, whole uh, autonomous uh, systems will occur the, the, the first, I would say. Um, and uh, here the, the major step is really to ensure this uh, safety and, and validation topic because we see a lot of the systems uh, being uh, developed with very tremendous uh, uh, capabilities, but then ensuring the safety uh, with a, a development process, that's key to bring it on, on, this, uh, on, the, uh, mm -hmm. on the street, in my perspective. Well, thank you all so much. I think we could have easily used another 30 minutes. Thank you to our attendees. This is recorded. You can watch it later. Um, thanks, Brian, Sean, Tino. Have a great rest of your day and your evening. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Bye. Thank you, Carla.